being hosted by um, ASU Mina Famer Regional Institute in collaboration with the Mahe Famer Institute. And uh, it has been a pleasure uh, meeting people from different parts of the globe, uh, seeing them signing up for this webinar during the time of this crisis. Uh, we began with a session uh, on competencies for online teaching uh, by Hasnain, which was later uh, followed by Summer on rubrics uh, for online assessment. And uh, the one that happened just uh, before this session was related to uh, assessment of clinical competence by Mohammed Hani. So uh, these three webinars have generated a lot of interest. And uh, I could see that a lot of discussions happening in this context. Uh, even today, I just had in my university somebody acknowledging uh, Mohammed Hani's presentation on uh, assessment of clinical competence uh, when there was a discussion happening uh, in our campus. So uh, that means uh, these webinars have helped people to actually, uh, you know, uh, learn certain things and uh, basically share information that is very vital during this time of crisis. And uh, I must also thank Summer who wholeheartedly agreed uh, to, uh, to be a part of this uh, collaborative, uh, you know, uh, event. Today, uh, we have with us uh, Professor John Gilbert. Uh, well, uh, John needs uh, no introduction in uh, the community of interprofessional educators. Uh, but for many of us who have not yet opened our doors and windows and are still in silos, uh, maybe I think I will introduce uh, Professor John who has uh, been a seminal leader in the uh, education of health professionals in British Columbia, Canada, and uh, internationally. Uh, in the early part of his career, he actually pioneered linguistics and psychology uh, as the basis of practice for speech language pathologists. Later, uh, it was his vision and leadership that led to the concept of interprofessional education being developed as a central tenet of team-based, collaborative, patient-centered practice and care. Now, uh, these concepts are a part of the University, College and Institute of Health Sciences training in many places across Canada and globally. Well, uh, he is a distinguished uh, faculty and a visiting professor to a number of renowned institutes, which I'm not going to list because we don't have much time. Uh, but in the context of this particular seminar, uh, I would like to say that uh, when we started Mahe Famer in India in 2015, uh, we really wanted someone uh, who would mentor us in the field of interprofessional education. Because the focus of our institute was interprofessional education uh, being one of the most important aspects to be covered. So that is where we uh, got introduced to John, and John has been a mentor since then uh, with five batches. Uh, doing uh, phenomenal work in the field of interprofessional education and practice, carrying out projects. Uh, John has been guiding us at every single step. Uh, so it is a pleasure to actually welcome uh, a giant in the field of interprofessional education and uh, most importantly, uh, our own mentor, I would say, uh, Professor John Gilbert, and uh, above all, a fantastic human being uh, whom I have met. So uh, it, over to you, John. Uh, uh, please uh, go ahead. Well, um, thank you for that very kind and generous invitation, Siraj. I, I hope that I earn it as we go through this uh, one hour. And um, good morning, everybody from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, my province is in the top left hand corner of the country in case you're wondering where I am. Um, it is a sunny day, and in Vancouver, it is seven o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> when uh, Siraj asked me if I would talk about, uh, in the COVID world, interprofessional education for collaborative practice, um, 
we had uh, not yet actually um, entered the stage of lockdown that <clears throat> we've uh, been enjoying, haha, uh, not for the past uh, two and a half months. We're just coming into phase two in British Columbia. And uh, what it has meant is that our university, <clears throat> the University of British Columbia, <clears throat> has had to grapple with uh, the uh, whole notion of what we've called um, emergency remote learning. Um, we don't want to confuse this with uh, online learning because there is such a really good literature around online learning. And uh, what I would like to do this morning is to share with you um, and have you hopefully think about some issues that have been um, boiling around in my head for the last two months um, and uh, maybe a little before that. So the first part of my talk is going to be about the population of learners that we are going to be working with um, in the years ahead. And then I'm going to turn to a brief uh, discussion of how we can do interprofessional team-based learning um, in this kind of emergency remote learning um, phase. Now, uh, we have, I think, lost my screen. Um, so I need to know how to forward my slides. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so in the COVID world, I just want to remind us that there are some realities uh, that uh, have really come to the fore as we have needed to switch out of our usual ways of thinking about teaching and learning. Um, we've certainly discovered that humans have psychological biases. And if you've been teaching for 25 or 30 years, um, you certainly have biases about the way you want to teach. And we have to tip those biases up as we think about this emergency remote learning. Um, we also have, you know, our actions based on cultural assumptions. So I apologize because my discussion today has a very Western tinge. And I recognize that that's not always in line with other parts of the world. But we do have these cultural assumptions and the cultural assumptions are not only about where we are, they're about who we are, um, the professions in which we're engaged, uh, the, the groups that we belong to, et cetera. And um, as we have discovered, um, we're always working with inconsistent incentives. So we've had lots of discussions. Uh, we just finished a survey at our university of the students who had to go into this emergency learning, uh, remote learning um, right from the start. And we've discovered that there are some incentives that are missing um, as we work with them because of these biases we have about teaching and learning um, that come from a previous time. Now, um, so I think that this uh, coronavirus related disruption gives us an opportunity to rethink professional education. And by that, I mean not just um, the way in which each of us as professionals think about how to educate physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers, but also about the place of health education within the community at large. And that's a very interesting point. And um, so uh, what we've recognized is that, of course, now knowledge is just this mouse click away. And uh, any of you who sat with a class of 30 or 40 students who have their laptops open in front of them are well aware of the fact that they are clicking at the time that we may be talking. And so we have to think about the role of the educator and how that must change. And I, I came across this wonderful painting wandering about in a sea of fog. And I thought, well, um, that captures some of where I am at the moment. I don't know about you. And what we want to do is to kind of figure out how do we get through this foggy time so that not only do we continue with our traditional learning, teaching and learning, but we then begin to encompass all of the potential that's associated with remote learning. And as you have discovered, because I know you've been doing it, about online learning. Now, uh, I still, so, oh, 
the, the generation who are going to be coming to us, and in fact are with us at the moment, they're called Gen Z. You know, we had Gen Z, we had uh, Gen, uh, we had the millennials, we had et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are students who were born between 1995 and 2012. So we have students coming into our programs now who really have grown up in a globalized world. Um, and that's that's certainly not true of me growing up, and it's possibly not true of many of you. And that globalized world has really got them thinking about um, what their education is looking and lo is going to look like as a result of the pandemic. And we've already heard from our students about their anxieties, their concerns, uh, for example, about how they're going to learn clinically. Um, so they've been reflecting very seriously on how this pandemic is going to affect the education they're going to get beginning yesterday or this year or last year. Um, they are clearly a generation that is defined by technology. And what I've discovered is that some of my more uh, senior uh, fellows uh, within the university environment are still very challenged by technology. And um, it's a very, very big hurdle to climb over if you are challenged by technology, but we have to recognize that this generation is completely defined by technology. They expect instant communication, you know, Instagram, WhatsApp, TikTok. Uh, they have it on their phones and uh, they know how to do it. And it's it's really a, a challenge for me, certainly at some times to think, oh, now what's that thread going through WhatsApp? or why are they putting this up on Instagram? Um, so this expectation of instant communication and feedback is both a good thing, but uh, it's also a, it's a very hard thing because it creates anxieties and those anxieties are not easily overcome, but that's the way of their world. And that instant communication um, has just been amplified, we've noticed in the last two and a half, three months by this move to remote learning. Um, they are they are going across these various platforms much faster than I am able at times to to go. Um, so we I think it's very important that as we are thinking about these changes we're going to be making that this generation I'm not talking about you know the students who are now in their fifth or fourth or sixth year I'm talking about the ones who are coming in now that we're going to be confronted with as this pandemic continues to be rolled out in ways that we're not familiar with at the present time. Um, and what we've observed um, is that actually these, these students see the power of working collaboratively. Um, I was very impressed, for example, my youngest grandson is now 17, so he's kind of in this stage and age. And right from the time that he started grade school in Vancouver in Canada, they were given not homework, but collaborative projects. So they have been working collaboratively right, right from primary school education through their high school education. And I, I suspect that that's true in many, many other places in the world, but I don't have data to support that, but I suspect it's true. You know, the technology hasn't been just kind of stuck in <laughs> North America. And, and they are very concerned about climate change. We only have to think about the, the climate change protests that have been mounted by students who are coming to us. They're very concerned about mental health. We have just completed a uh, survey. Uh, well, we completed it about a year ago, a survey of the concerns about mental health within our student population at the University of British Columbia. And we heard things that we had never heard before uh, from students. They, they are much more attuned to, you know, how education is affecting their mental health. And, um, sorry, we, I got, uh, and um, they know that they have this collective responsibility to isolate and to protect members of the community. It's very, very interesting here because we still are in quasi lockdown. Um, how careful this this generation is about being sure that their parents and their grandparents are in fact uh, protected um, in this in this endemic uh, pandemic and they are now becoming the zoomer generation 
Um, we use Zoom at my university, and I, I know that we're using a different platform now, but I'll just call it the Zoomer generation. They are really um, in there doing this as we, as we as the weeks roll by. And it's very interesting because they're saying, you know what, I'm not sure that I want to go back all the time to a classroom. Um, we all recognize, and the students tell us, the classroom is really, really important. But, you know, there are things that we can do that do not need to be in the classroom. So everybody now is familiar with the flipped classroom notion. You know, give them things to do offline so that the time that's spent online doing what these students are doing here are hoping to do, um, that is discussing the issues rather than sitting, listening to a sage on a stage, coming together in groups and talking about the issues that they've been reading about in an asynchronous fashion um, elsewhere. So this Zoomer generation is what we are confronted with now. And I think that I certainly am learning every day something new that I didn't know before about how to use this technology in ways that are very useful with respect to the next generation of health and social care providers. Um, now, the post-COVID world is also very, very interesting technologically. So I was looking at some data from the Dell Technologies, and I was just blown away by the fact 85% of the jobs in 2030, it is estimated the Generation Z will, that are going to enter haven't even been invented yet. And um, as I look at the newspaper each day or a, a range of newspapers each day, I am amazed, I don't know why, but I am amazed at how many new approaches are being taken in order to overcome the obstacles that are being thrown up by the pandemic. How new technologies are kind of being invented overnight in order to get around a problem that wasn't there before, but has been thrown up by the pandemic. So this generation, when they're looking ahead is saying, uh, well, they're not saying, but we know that there's gonna be a huge number of things that not even on the, on the radar yet. And um, what we also know from work that's been done in industry and, and in our own fields in health is that um, we, we have to understand the interrelatedness uh, between all of the things that are we're confronted with uh, and I'll speak specifically about the healthcare industry. Um, in North America, it has been fascinating to see how we've been retraining surgeons, neurosurgeons, ophthalmologists, pediat pediatricians to become people with lots of lung experience because we simply haven't had enough people um, with lung experience to take care of this population who are coming in uh, with COVID. And so this, this, this rapid move to understand the interrelatedness of each of the professions, which is really the heart of interprofessionalism, and then to kind of navigate across those boundaries is absolutely vital if we're going to make the most uh, of the differences um, that exist at the present time and their necessary differences. You, you know, we need people to be trained as neurologists and pediatricians, etc. But also to work globally then in a collaborative fashion in order to understand, you know, what this interrelatedness is all about. Um, uh, so the technology of the future, it's going to be a terrific challenge, these students who are finishing. And then this, this notion of, of kind of working more and more on inter, the interrelatedness of our health and, and social care professions, um, not even thinking about things outside of our, our fields of, of uh, health and social care. Um, because it's clear that we're never going to have enough physicians and nurses and physiotherapists, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding that interrelatedness will kind of smooth some of this difficulty that we have with, oh, we don't have one of them, so what are we gonna do now? An indication of change in professional practice came home to me uh, about a, two weeks or three weeks ago 
Um, I was reading a report from the Royal College of General Practitioners in the UK, and it was absolutely fascinating. In the four weeks leading up to April the 12th, about 71% of routine consultations were remote compared to 25% last year. Primary health care is undergoing a very, very sudden change. Um, I had to call my physician uh, last week um, and uh, I asked him this question. So I said, I won't give you his name. So how are you managing? He said, well, John, I'm doing about three quarters of my work online. And I said, well, how do you like that? He said, well, in some ways it's very, very, very useful um, because it means that when I have a patient who needs more time, because I'm online, I can take more time. And some of the things that I have to deal with really only take two and a half, three minutes, you know, giving a prescription or whatever, just to make it simple. But what we're going to be seeing in professional practice, not only this change of routine in primary health care, which of course we've been talking about since, Al since Alma Ati, right, in, in 1978, but also it's happening because I had to see a, phys a physiotherapist and the physiotherapist says, oh, well, we'll do an online consultation. Um, th so the, the practice is, is changing with respect to this technology. And so these, these apps um, that, that mediate this virtual consultation with a range of functions from text to video are becoming increasingly more in demand and one of them is called MD Live. You're probably aware of it. It's a very, very good app. And I asked my physician about it. He says, oh, yes, we're aware of this. Um, he said, so I asked him about text versus video because we were simply online with audio. And he said, well, we're now working with um, a possible video response. And anybody who's done telemedicine will be familiar with this because we do telemedicine in remote corners of our province. We live in a in a province which is uh, very, very large. And I'm sorry about this. Um, um, and so we're, we're familiar with telemedicine, but the fact that it's occurring in family practices, you know, the primary health care here in the city is very interesting. So he thinks he will be using video um, in a much more um, instructive way in his practice than ever before. I don't think, in fact, he said, I don't think I've ever used video before. So, so the, this, this, there are these indicators of change in professional practice. And he, we had this very, very brief one and a half minute talk. I said, well, what about other health professionals? He says, it's great. I now have time to talk to some people who I am referring my patients to, not physicians, which I never had before. So, this 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 development of apps very interesting lots of issues associated with it but one that we're all looking out at looking for so um delivering then ipe with technology um it's clear and i've tried to find an illustration which demonstrates this that educational institutions are i'm sure yours are kind of harnessing utilizing um, technological tools to create this content for remote uh, interprofessional learning. Um, at my university, we use something called Canvas um, for um, uh, online learning. It's a very, very good piece of software. I'm not advertising, I have nothing to do with it. It's just that we find it extremely useful. Um, and what we will see is more and more of these happening. And, and actually it presents a bit of a problem because we, at the moment we have a lot of platforms for doing what we're doing today. And we're using Team, Microsoft Team here. Um, I, we use Zoom most of the time. Um, and then globally, the educators themselves are looking at new possibilities to do things differently and with a lot greater flexibility. And so new ideas about interprofessional collaboration are coming about. And, and Siraj and I know from the work of interprofessional.global um, how these things are, are, are coming into being. Um, I'm very, uh, very interested in the work. We have a center for um, educational um, initiatives in health. And yesterday we were talking about um, the survey that was done with our students, but also um, we have 50 people online. Also, what is it that they've been observing uh, in the last two and a half, three months with respect to their own teaching practices? And I would say, you know, uh, 
it would not be an uh, an error to say that everybody who is on that um, webinar yesterday, it's not really a webinar, um, everybody was talking about new things they were doing in order to put stuff on an iPad or to put it on uh, an iPhone um, or to put it on even on a watch, which I found really fascinating. Um, so, so we are going to see, um, and I'm sure it's happening amongst all of you. You're looking at new ways, new possibilities um, for working flexibly with all of these devices we have now. However, I do recognize, and we were talking about this yesterday, that there are a number of issues. First of all, there's the problem of bandwidth. Um, and uh, <laughs> Siraj and I were talking about that before we started today. You know, did we have enough bandwidth for what we were going to be doing? So we have to be very careful to recognize that there are some students, maybe more than we can than we are aware of, who don't have access to broadband in the way that we would like them to have at the university level. And so, how do we bring the technology in to recognize? that the students who may be in some um, rural location, because that's where they're doing some practice, maybe don't have that broadband access. That's a, that's a very, very important piece um, that we've been thinking about and trying to make sure that we don't put something beyond the range of the broadband that's available to the students. The second is that, of course, um, this is not cost free. Um, so we have to be sure that um, when we are asking students to do things with digital technology that um, we're not asking them for a huge financial investment which they can't afford because then of course education becomes inequitable um, and that's that's a big issue so um, redefining the role of the educator is uh, I think where we're where we're really grappling now um, we, we are actually at a place where we think that the educator knowledge holder who kind of stands in front of the class and gives, you know, their wisdom, it's no longer really fit for purpose. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we dump that entirely. <laughs> As I said earlier, we still need uh, classroom um, experiences. But I think they're, what we've recognized that they're neat, that they're does not need to be as many of those as we had in the past. We really need to work um, with technology, which is fit for the purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, and we're aware that we have to, uh, as educators, um, make what we're doing um, available so that the students can, in fact, access and even learn technical skills with a few clicks on their phones or tablets or their computers. We were somewhat worried about this because we said, oh, well, this technology, you know, it's it's complicated. Forgetting what I said earlier about Generation Z, they know this stuff, but it's actually putting in a putting it in a technological fashion um, that allows them to use it intelligently and allows us to help them to use it intelligently by being intelligent about it ourselves. Um, so what we're what we're really recognizing is that uh, as educators, we're moving to kind of facilitation um, of the development of interprofessional skills rather than kind of teaching as a stage on the stage. So um, we're doing work around um, what a facilitator looks like in a profession, uniprofessionally, and then what does a facilitator look like when that facilitator is responsible for developing interprofessional skills. And I came across this, this lovely little saying, be humble, be teachable, and always keep learning. And because I don't know about you as teachers, educators, but certainly for me, you know, I know that if I don't keep learning, I'm not sure that I can be true to the educational mission, which is my life, which is educating students. Um, so, and being teachable, you know, ready to ready to um, recognize that there are some things I I don't know and I really need to know. So keep on learning. I I was fascinated um, to I was listening to some of my colleagues um, in the center yesterday. One of them said, 
I would imagine students want to be using their time being as useful to this challenging time as they can. So I think the more opportunity we give them to bring them to the patient, interacting with them in a meaningful, safe way, they can, that can be great to help link education with care and help preceptors have more sources of connectedness. While at the same time, students can build confidence. And the good thing about virtual is that the preceptor can be a fly on the wall and observe safely in real time. And in a sense, um, what I'm gonna be talking about in the second part of this presentation is this notion of being the fly on the wall as we try to facilitate interprofessional interactions. So moving the dial then, um, I think that uh, we're really, really now confronted with the, the necessary a recognition of two essential skills. We have to be resilient because we're going to fade if we're not resilient. And we know that um, in a sense, that's what we're asking of our students, that they that their resilience be much greater um, than it has been heretofore because things are getting thrown at us every day. And we and at the same time, we have to be adaptable. Um, so resilience and adaptability are hugely important. And in order to get that notion of being resilient, of being adaptable, it's interesting to think about creativity, new ways, effective communication, um, and uh, let's face it, we know that many of the adverse events that occur in health and social care are because we don't have effective communication, collaboration, empathy, and emotional intelligence, and then being able to work across demographic and professional lines of difference to harness the power of international collaborative teamwork. So uh, this is just an illustration of some of the pieces that are associated with resilience, strength, confidence, motivation, protecting yourself, et cetera. But those skills, resilience and adaptability are things that I am thinking a lot about at the present time, how, and probably will, well, probably I will go on thinking about, how is it that we adapt, we, we give our students um, th that feeling of resilience, that feeling that they are in fact really adaptable. So let me move then um, to learning with Zoom. And I and I, I apologize, uh, this is just um, the, the platform that I'm most uh, familiar with, but I yeah. think that... Uh, John, uh, this yeah, was sorry, the point uh, that we thought, yeah, yeah. We will sorry. take uh, any questions if people have, they could unmute themselves and uh, uh, post the questions or if we have questions in the chat box, um, Honey or me, uh, we are going to uh, address that. Okay. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Prabhu from Manipal. That's nice you're listening to the, Dr. Professor John. My question is, uh, in this challenging times, how do you see future of clinical teaching and uh, clinical assessment? Yeah. Uh, well, those are two huge issues, and thank you for the question. Um, so I'm going to, uh, in the next part, talk about interprofessional uh, and some ideas I have about uh, using Zoom for interprofessional learning. Um, we, of course, uh, as soon as uh, we were locked down at the university, um, the whole of the health social care uh, professional part of the university was thinking, how on earth are we going to get our students into practice? At the moment, we've done it mostly by this um, emergency remote learning. That is, we've been uh, using Canvas, the software I was talking about, which is for online learning. We've been using Zoom, and we've been brought, trying to bring the patient into that activity. And I'll talk some more about that in a moment. Um, it, uh, until it is it's clear from our provincial health officer that it is now safe for students to be readmitted into learning in, for example, the acute care sector. We are just grappling with ways of teaching and learning um, off online and, as I say, um, in this kind of uh, topic uh, environment. Assessment is a huge, huge problem. Um, it is not just in our you know, health and, and social care professions, but the university has been uh, very, very, very concerned about how to grade students who are kind of almost finished with their degrees 
and we'd be talking about, you know, incomplete and should we just have a pass fail? How do we how do we do assessment when students are online, etc.? So I don't have good answers to those questions. I don't know who has good answer at the present time, but they are beginning to emerge. And so I think you have to keep looking at the literature in order to, to see what the solutions are that are being put up there and then trying them and, and seeing whether they will work work for us and work generally. But thank you. These are two very, very important issues. Uh, John, I have a question that is linked uh, uh, to the previous one. How can we teach teamwork to students when they are scattered all over the place? Uh, any ideas? Is it going okay, to affect gonna, the collaborative activities? OK, I'm going to talk about that now in the second part of the um, presentation. All right. OK. So I think uh, we'll move. And uh, those who have questions could either put in the chat or uh, use our WhatsApp group and ask your questions there. Over to you, uh, John. Please go okay. ahead. So let me just, um, <laughs> I always, I have to remind audiences, even though they may know, that interprofessional education for people-centered collaborative practice, we have a definition, and the definition says that um, interprofessional education is learning with, from, and about each other. And the purpose of that is to improve collaboration and the purpose of that is to improve the quality of care and services. So all the time that I am thinking about interprofessional education, I'm saying, how are these students learning with each other? What are they learning from each other? And what are they learning about each other? Because those are kind of the fundamental pillars that, that under kind of right good, collaboration. If you look at poor team-based collaborative practice, what you'll see is that the professionals really don't know much about each other at all, if they know anything at all. You just have to listen to stereotypes. You ask, you ask an ex, well, what's a physiotherapist? Possibly have no idea. You ask a why, well, what does a nurse do? They have sometimes no idea whatsoever. So learning with, from, and about each other, purpose of collaboration. So this, what I'm going to talk about, is based on that definition. Now, I many thanks to Siraj for providing this figure in his presentation, Instructional Methods for Online Courses. Um, Zooming has to support the principle of student connectedness, which I think is what Siraj was capturing in this slide from his presentation. If it doesn't support connectedness, then we're faced with all kinds of issues, one of which may sound strange, but it's loneliness. You know, when students come to class and they're together, there is a, a connectedness, there's a, um, a, a scholarly kind of organization, a, a feeling of friendship that is associated with being in that class. But when you say now we're going to bring you online, you're going to be in your own room, um, that connectedness begins to fray. And we have no idea yet of whether students are lonely. So we have to really support this principle of connectedness and think kind of creatively about how we form that connectedness. So we have, as we can see from this figure, kind of formal learning groups, all right? And um, so that's when we will say, okay, we're gonna have 20 students online who are going to be learning about a particular um, clinical issue. And they may all be from the same profession, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, whatever. Um, so in that formal learning group, it's possible to develop ways of ensuring that the students are connected with each other because they're all learning about the same thing. Then uh, we have to think about how do you do it via informal social groups and thinking particularly back to my comment about resilience and adaptability. How do we use um, this, this Zoom, this uh, team, whatever, in order to foster the notion of being together? So. We've all read about people having, you know, parties online or singing online or whatever. It's a marvelous thing. 
I think it's absolutely essential we, as we are thinking about moving forward with um, our interprofessional and professional education, that we are creative about how we can do these informal social groups. Mentoring maybe, but not even mentoring, kind of telling the students, okay, get together and talk about it. in the profession to the profession, you know, the student connected to the profession, because when they are pre <laughs> pre-COVID days. When they were in um, their uh, professional learning environment, um, they were very closely attached to the profession. But when you take them out of that environment, uh, it's very, very hard to see, um, you know, how do they make that link back to being a member of the profession of medicine, the profession of nursing, the profession of pharmacy, et cetera. Um, so, that's when we, I think, need to bring in the professional associations and say, you start thinking about this issue because it's really important. You know, this is the basis of practice. Um, and then student connecting this to both to the teachers and peers um, in supporting trust and safety. Um, and we can, I can only just say those words today, but think about them, you know, educational trust, educational safety. How do we ensure that our students really do feel safe and they really do trust what it is that they're being taught, what it is they're learning um, in these dimensions. Now, one of the things, uh, even though I've said these, <laughs> these students or these, these Generation Z students know a lot about technology, they actually know somewhat less than you think, even if they are these digital natives. Um, and um, students, when they use their iPhones, for instance, at the present time, using WhatsApp, et cetera, know about groups, but they haven't been using technology for the purposes that we're setting them up now to use it for. That is for their education. It's been for other reasons. Um, and we have to recognize, as I've said earlier, that um, when they're accessing the internet um, on their phone, on their laptop, et cetera, um, they may have quite limited data. Um, and they'll need to reserve that data for other things that have to do with simply being alive. Um, they might, in fact, be sharing technology with other people in the house. We know that's true. And we know that uh, students who've been living together and are still now living because they've been quarantined together, um, it's hard for them to get the bandwidth. And so we have to be sure, as, again, to repeat something I said earlier, that what we're mounting recognizing those constraints. Um, and some students may have less time to do schoolwork, not more. That is, they're now having to find ways to support themselves financially, which they didn't have to do um, prior to COVID. Um, another big issue that we have to talk about. So what we discovered, and I suspect I'm not, I'm talking probably to many of you who know this, but I, I simply want to go through it again. You have to explain how the platform works, okay? Whether you're using Zoom as we do, or Team, or Blue Jeans, or whatever the, the one that you have to, because it's not self evident. Um, it's not certainly not self evident to faculty members how this works. In fact, we're putting on courses for our faculty to, so they understand the, the potential of Zoom. Um, <clears throat> It's very useful to discover that when students sign in, that they always have their name and their discipline in their photograph. It, it Then there's not this kind of awkwardness. Well, where are you from? What do you do? What's your name, et cetera? It's immediately there. Um, we found, and we decided not to use this today, but they need to know how polling works because we use polling extensively in these learning exercises. And we know that um, in order to have really effective polling, um, we have to set, well, we have to write and agree on the questions ahead of the meeting. We call them Zoom meetings ahead of the meeting um, because you can't just make them up as you go along. This is very, very important to get the polling um, in place. They have to understand what a conference room is. Um, and we've had a lot of difficulty, uh, not so much now, but when we began this, explaining to faculty members that you don't have to have all the students in the same room. You know, you can have conference rooms scattered around and then as the facilitator can kind of walk from room to room to room and then bring all the rooms together at the end for a full scale discussion. 
Um, so it's very, very important that they understand, you know, the kind of flexibility. Um, and then be sure that our students understand the role of the facilitator and of the patient, because what we're trying to do is bring in students from our patient voice network to be intimately engaged in this learning activity. Since we can't take the students into the clinical environment, uh, well, not at the present time, we need that voice, that, that patient voice of experience to help as we talk about interprofessional issues. And it's very, very, very important to explain the evaluation procedure. Students, to come back to a question that I was asked earlier, students are really concerned about, you know, how am I going to be graded on this? Um, you know, this isn't like anything that we ever did before. And now I'm going to be talking a lot and you're going to be watching me interaction. How are you going to evaluate? So we have to be very clear about what that evaluation procedure is going to look like. And 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 we had an extremely good webinar prior to this one that talked about some of those procedures. And I'm sure that as these webinars progress, there will be lots more discussion about the evaluation procedure because it's not going to be quite like what we've done before, given the format in which we're doing the, the platforms in which we're doing it. So Zoom give us gives us these opportunities at the bottom meetings video webinars, conference rooms, phone systems, etc. And it's, as I say, very, very important that our students understand um, how Zoom works in each of these settings. You can't just choose one and say, well, this is the only one we're going to use. Be sure they understand what the opportunities are. And incidentally, when I looked at, um, thank you to Siraj and uh, Honey for this, and I looked at um, the, the platform we're using today, there's a lot of similarities between them. OK, now, so to get to the question I was asked earlier, um, supposing then now we're at a place when we want to set up to have a scenario for learning with each other, all right? I think the best way to do this, um, it, you, can't, you can't do it in a usual classroom, you know, you can't do it with students sitting in rows. Choosing a complex condition like diabetes, COPD, et cetera, brings together professionals from a number of different professional backgrounds, physicians, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this complex condition is what we want them to learn about interprofessionally because we want them to know, well, this, if you think about diabetes, this is the pharmacist's role in managing diabetes. This is the physician's role. This is what the nurse does. This is how we bring in the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist, et cetera, et cetera. It's a complex condition. It's a huge and wonderful opportunity to bring the profession together. And then we bring in a patient who has diabetes, type one, type two, doesn't really matter. But a patient who we have trained to be more than just the patient. And I have to be careful saying the word just because I don't mean to be pejorative. Um, our patient Net voices network in Canada is absolutely amazing. And our, our, our patients are, are really well trained for teaching. And then um, in that group, we need an IP, an interprofessionally trained faculty facilitator to come back to a point I made earlier. Um, you can't just pluck a faculty member out of their department and say, you're going to be the facilitator um, for this session um, on diabetes. We, we, we have to train these uh, facilitators and there's a lot of work being done. As I said, we will have to leave that for another time and then six or more um, health professionals and then the asynchronous learning events that we want to precede this. So we want to be sure that we have told our students what it is we would like them to read um, before they come to this, uh, this particular learning environment, what it is we want them to have watched. Lots of wonderful videos out there. Sometimes there's a movie that deals with something that we are, and say, well, watch the movie and see how the patient is taken in the movie. So this is a scenario for learning with each other. Now, once they are assigned, we assign these students to conference rooms, and then in the conference room, the objective is to learn from each other and about each other's professional capacities as they discuss the questions about, in this instance, diabetes. Um, so learning from each other 
that means they have to learn to listen and they have to learn to ask questions. And that's part of what the interprofessional part is, listening, asking pertinent questions, reflecting, then coming back with something different about the question, about what it is that they've learned from somebody else in the group. So, so just to take a simple example, because it's so complicated, um, the physiotherapist will say to the pharmacist, well, I don't, I don't understand, you know, what is it that the pharmacist does in, for the diabetic patient? So here's the learning from each other. So then the pharmacy student says, well, you know, we're trained to do this and this and this. And then as that interaction is going on, the students are also learning about each other's professional capacities because inevitably they get to talk about a scope of practice. And that is a very, very interesting problem. Again, it's for another time. Um, in uh, Canada, the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences has written a brilliant report on scopes of practice. And in fact, I'm looking back at it now um, because I think there are things that we're going to have to really rethink around scopes of practice. But this learning from each other as they talk in the conference room about each other's professional capacity, very, very important. And the discussion questions should be based on IPE competencies. Canada, the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative, and the Interprofessional Health Collaborative in the United States have developed a set of interprofessional competencies. Um, we want them to, to be aware, the facilitators to be aware of these competencies, how you bring them into the um, conversation. Um, and again, the, the students, should be prepared prior to coming to the meeting about what the competencies are. And again, that's another discussion because that's something you can do asynchronously, online, reading, thinking about it. And there's some, again, some really interesting videos that deal with this. Um, and then, as I said, uh, a, a trained patient who's actually begins the discussion by saying, here's my condition. So it's not the profession which leads the discussion, it's the patient, you know? The patient is the center of attention, but also a member of the team who is describing, or who is working on her care. Very important to ensure that, you know, the patient's voice is heard from the start. And um, I, I once gave a talk saying, the patient's not a hockey puck. You know, we have to be really careful when we talk about the team not to envision the team as, you know, a team of hockey players pushing a puck around and the puck is the patient. No. So this trained patient who knows how to work with students, knows about learning, begins the discussion. And in some instances, you can get the, the patient to kind of facilitate the questions. But again, that's for another time. Um, and then there are the elephants in the Zoom. <laughs> I said, um, you know, you got to set the ground rules. Um, and one of those ground rules has, had to, has to be made very clearly. Don't hog the discussion, you know. Um, everybody has to have an opportunity to talk. Everybody has to have an opportunity to reflect and to explain. Um, we need to, as I said, everybody needs to understand how Zoom works, but they really, really do need to understand how to ask a question and how to vote. Um, and, you know, the hand up function that we have here today is very useful. One, but I'm, I'm really amazed at the number of people who don't know how to use that. And then review the evaluation metrics, um, how they've learned from, you know, what are the things that I talked about much earlier? You know, what's the evaluation going to look from? But what we're looking about is what did they learn from each other? What did they learn about each other? What did they learn with each other based on the competencies? And then always be sure that the students have an opportunity to debrief after a session like this, where the facilitator goes away. The patient is no longer there. The students simply get to talk to each other about what it was that was happening. Um, very, very important piece of this, of this learning. And then paying attention all the time, the facilitator paying attention <coughs> to student wellness because it's very interesting what comes up in these groups or doesn't come up in these groups when there's some worry about wellness. And then protecting, of course, so this is an elephant in the Zoom, protecting from bombing. Um, I put up a website here um, that you can look at um, and everybody's welcome to this presentation. It's uh, open access. 
um, because bombing um, can be very, very injurious um, to the learning process. And then finally, this is a very useful um, device. I, I didn't want to work through it. <coughs> it's online. <coughs> And the references at the bottom online is written by uh, Alison Yano. It's extremely good. It's really about online learning, online teaching. Um, and you will be familiar because I think Siraj went through a number of these points. But I just thought it was useful to bring it up again and say, here's a metric um, that you can look at and hopefully will help um, your learning. Um, here's some resources about um, uh, teaching that I found very, I, I find very useful. And then um, you know, we do have to call a spade a spade. Um, so we'll have wonderful theories about doing this, you know, and we'll be thinking about those theories. But in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. But by golly, when you get down to try and practice this, you discover there is this link. So um, I hope you appreciate the cartoon. I thought it was pretty funny. But thank you all for your attention. And if there are some more questions, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, Siraj, over to you. <coughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, John, uh, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes if uh, if there is someone who wants to unmute, identify themselves and ask a question. The questions that have come up in the chat box, uh, uh, you have mostly answered them. It's related to, you know, uh, one question was related to the community participation. Another one was related to assessment. Good. Do we have uh, any other questions for John? Yeah, all uh, we can see is uh, people uh, thanking you and uh, expressing their uh, you know, gratitude for this wonderful informative presentations. Shama, are you online? Okay. Uh, so if uh, there is a request, can you display the useful devices slide? It was that. Which was what? Which slide? This useful devices, that is the one which. Oh, yeah, um, there we go. Um, Siraj, uh, I don't know how you can um, make sure people get this, um, but the reference is at the bottom of the slide for you, and feel free to just take it off. And uh, no, uh, we can actually, uh, you just send the PowerPoint to us, we'll make a PDF, and, and or okay. whatever it is, we can share with them, no problem. Uh, Siraj, I think we, we have raised the hand from uh, Dr. Amun Abu Saud. Yeah, please go ahead, Mona. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am Mona Abu Saud. I am a professor of internal medicine at the Alexandria Faculty of Medicine in Egypt. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation a lot, dear sir. And um, I have one question to you. Do you use a real patient or a standardized patient with the online IPE? Uh, a real patient. Um, and the reason we, um, a number of years ago, um, and you, this may be useful for you, um, our patients um, uh, actually went to the Minister of Health and said, you know, nobody ever listens to us. <laughs> and they actually set up an organization. So we're very fortunate. We, we have real patients who there's a, a now an association in Canada. I think we have like 500 members in this. And in British Columbia, my province, we have a very, very active patient population. And they love being involved. You know, real patients really love being involved. Now, we have to train them because <laughs> sometimes they just want to talk all the time about their whatever it is is their problem. But once you actually train them to be good facilitators and, and to be teachers, they love it. I mean, because they never imagined that they'd ever be a teacher. And here they are being a teacher, but they have a problem. Um, so yeah, now there are standardized uh, patients. Uh, it's, uh, we find that much more expensive because we have to train as people. Usually they're actors, we have to pay them. And uh, our patients, we discover, don't mind coming for free. <laughs> so, but yeah, real patients are wonderful. 
So you don't pay your Maria patient. has a related question. Maria has, is asking whether the patient also will come on the Zoom. Ah, well, we're only just now um, kind of asking that question um, because there will be there'll be ethical issues. Um, there may be um, uh, safety issues. Uh, we have to work through those before we can say, yes, they can come on to Zoom. Um, and just uh, so, so yeah, that's that, that's a that's a big discussion topic at the present time. We don't I don't have an answer. And with respect to payment, um, yes, um, we we've had a lot of discussion about payment of patients um, because we're now looking at them as kind of respondents. Um, so there is an agreement within our Ministry of Health. And I think it actually pertains across Canada, but I won't, I, I can't swear to that. But in our Ministry of Health, there is an agreement that when pa patients participate in learning exercises, they do get an honorarium. We don't call it a salary. Um, we, do, we do pay them an honorarium for, for and we certainly, uh, if they have to travel, we pay their travel. If they have to stay overnight somewhere, we pay for their overnight stay. Um, so, yeah, there are, uh, there are fiduciary matters that, um, you know, will continue to be worked out, but um, when they don't want to be paid, and some of them don't want to be paid at all, they're just happy to do it. So it's a personal choice, but thank you. Uh, there's another question. I can't make out who this person is, but the question is, uh, what is the level of students involved in online uh, interprofessional education? Yeah, well, as <laughs> that's, a, that's a complex issue because of the way in which uh, training for the various professions is organized. So we can have, for example, we can have third year medical students and fifth year nursing students and second year social work students in a group. And we're aware of the difference of experience with patient care across that kind of spread. And so we're working on um, how do we ensure that the questions that we're asking about competencies are really related to the interprofessional piece that the students will not have had before? Um, so it's a very interesting problem and one that I think uh, we're going to see a lot more discussion about, a lot more publication about, because it doesn't matter where you go in the world, these same conditions pertain. That is, we're, we're never going to get first year students across the spectrum. We're never going to get second year because of the way in which uh, professional pros programs have organized themselves. And this is true even in practice, because what we're trying to do is to ensure that the students, we prefer not to have second year students, we prefer them to come from third year and above, because by then they will have seen clinical problems and they will have an appreciation that, hmm, maybe we don't know everything, maybe there's somebody else who we need to call in on this. But thank you, that's, that's again, I've been asked a lot of very interesting and complex questions, Raj, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's one more question, um, I mean, that is related to the same one that you have addressed now. Asma's question, so Asma, that is done now. That's what we have discussed. Uh, Lulu has a question. Lulu asks, what is your recommendation about including all the four competencies uh, in the IP objectives and also assessing them? Is it necessary to include all four competencies each time in the objectives? Uh, well, that's, thanks, Lulu. Um, yeah, that's, an, that's another interesting question. So we, we kind of grappled with this. First of all, we want them to know that competencies are interrelated and integrated, right? But sometimes um, the focus should be, let's just take the one we're working on at Manipal at the moment, on communication, right? We really, really, really need to just drill on that and then see it within the context of the other competencies. Sometimes we we'll take a global view and we'll say, now let's just look at the entirety of the patient experience from when they've been diagnosed all the way through to what the treatment regimen is, et cetera. And then you want to get, but um, I think there's, there's a place for both approaches and it depends on um, what the patient is that you're gonna be talking about or talking with, how far along you are in that discussion with the patient. Because of course, once you start talking about diabetes, there's only one session, there are gonna be a number of different sessions about this. So it's an interesting problem, but. Sometimes you'll do, you'll just focus on one communication and sometimes you'll focus on the global because you want the students to get the 
the notion that there is this integration across uh, interprofessional practice and care. Thanks, Lulu. Yeah, rest, uh, of the questions are mainly on the, you know, whether we are going to share the presentations, recordings, and so on. Yes, we are going to do that. Uh, Hani is uh, uh, doing, uh, and he's going to do that, uh, share it in these platforms. Uh, one final question uh, from Linu. Uh, she is our faculty from uh, College of Nursing at Manipal. Linu is asking that how do we generate interest in interprofessional education for undergraduate students? Yeah. Uh, well, we uh, we started, uh, and there are a number of uh, undergraduate kind of interprofessional associations where. Uh, we actually start with bringing students together in just a, a social milieu. We say, okay, tonight we're going, <laughs> I don't know what it's like in, in India, but we'll say, well, we're going to give you food and pop and let's just get together and we'll have a games night and we'll invite people from all of the different uh, health, health social care providers, see who turns up. And uh, right from that little seed, we try to develop an understanding that, hey, you're not in this just with your profession. There are other, lots of other professions that it's essential that you get to know because when you get into practice, you're going to be working with those people. So, you know, learning together to work together is the issue that we address uh, when we're talking about undergraduates. So just an informal kind of night, a games night or something, then you have, you know, really good faculty who understand these issues to come and have a chat. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid that we have completely run yeah. out of time, but we have yeah. uh, two people have raised their hands, and I think uh, this, these are the last questions that we are going to take. One is uh, Dr. Mona, uh, please ask your question, and then Kofo. Yes, I was um, worried about the ethical issues. So considering the, the patient that you invite to take part in, in, in the Zoom learning activity, um, do you ask the patient to sign actually a written uh, consent before entering into the Zoom interprofessional educational activity? Ah, uh, well, we're you have to understand. I'm I'm passing these ideas right in front of you now as we're working our way through them. Oh, there will have to be there will have to be an ethical um, approval for uh, participation in this particular activity. Um, I mean, in the same way, you know, when uh, when our students are in practice, there is a the students don't know it, the patients don't know, but there is an ethical approval. But we we're going to we are thinking about how we're going to develop um, ethical consent around this. So we're not there yet. Stay tuned. But thank you. Another great question. <laughs> Go for the final question. Go for. Please unmute yourself. Go for. You have raised your hands. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Thank you so much for the lecture. I'm just wondering, because before every um, module of lectures, we do a pretest. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the safety of the questions. How can we affect this? Yeah, that's a, that's a very thorny issue. Um, the, the, so you do a pre-test so that you can monitor their activity and then do a post-test to see what it is that's been learned? That is it. That yeah. is it. Yeah, okay. So again, um, the, that raises the kind of ethical issues and whether or not, you know, you have approval to do that. Uh, in, our, in our system, we do. We can ask students questions at the beginning and at the end. We don't have to worry about um, you know, there, that there's going to be an ethical review because it's just seen as part of the teaching process. But I do think that the questions that you ask at the beginning, if it's around interprofessional, have to be related to the definition with from and about collaboration, quality of care, and to the competencies, because that's what you want to know that they have knowledge about once they have completed the activity. Uh, now, it's different. I mean, if you're doing a, a professional activity with as a and set of conditions. Now for interprofessional, it's about definition and it's about the competences. Have they got it? Have they learned it by the time they get to the end of the exercise? So yeah, it's a very interesting problem. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very much. Uh, thank you uh, 
all participants who joined us uh, today on this webinar. Uh, on behalf of uh, Mahe Famer Regional Institute and ASU Mina Famer Regional Institute, we would like to thank you all uh, for being with us today. And uh, a special thanks to John who has uh, spared his time and you know uh, shared with us uh, his expertise. Uh, we will be sharing this presentation with you. And the uh, next presentation, uh, as you all know, is uh, on the data. Uh, the presentation is going to be, uh, the webinar is going to be uh, conducted by Dr. Sina Biju, uh, who is from the Malaysian, in, uh, the Manipal International University uh, at Malaysia. So uh, till then, uh, stay Siraj? safe. Siraj? Ah, yes, Sama. May, yes. may I just extend my thanks to John for being with us today and for wake, waking up this early and giving <laughs> us giving us a lot of his wisdom as as usual. So thank yeah. you for being with us today, uh, John, and thank you, okay. Siraj, for managing and the. Uh, uh, before before we leave, uh, I want to uh, you know uh, those who are not aware today is Summer's birthday, so. Oh, happy yes, birthday, Summer! Thank you, thank you, oh, thank you, Siraj. That's <laughs> a big birthday. gathering. <laughs> so it's it's on the international thing, no? People uh, yes. are going to celebrate it. <laughs> yeah, let this is also my Coco from let... Nigeria. Happy birthday! <laughs> oh, happy birthday! Thank you so much, Coco. I just want to uh, happy uh, birthday, uh, summer. Thank you, guys. Just please, please, because I can see you from all over the world. Can we please enter our countries in the Padlet? Uh, if you do not have the link, I will send it on the chat function. It mm -hmm. will be very useful to see where you guys are from. And yes. thank you again, John. Summer thank you so much. Be safe. Be well. Take care, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Happy Bye. birthday. Bye.